What do you and I really need to know to get by in life? If you'll stay tuned, we'll examine that question together. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love And now your host for The Truth in Love, Dave Miller I suppose most people would say that what we really need to know is how to make a living, how to make money, how to survive in life in terms of material things. Very few people would zero in on what we really need to know. Johnny Ramsey, a regular speaker on our program, is with us today. After this song, he will be examining the subject, What the World Needs to Know. How precious is the food divine by inspiration here. Bright the lamp is praise and shine to guide my soul to heaven. Holy mortal food divine, precious treasure thou art mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my My drooping heart in this dark veil of tears. Light to my life is still in parts and quells my rising fears. Holy Bible, good divine, precious treasure thou art mine. Land to my feet and the light to my way to guide me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In that familiar passage of John 3, 16 and 17, did you notice how many times the word world was found? It'd be a very interesting lesson for us to study what the Bible says, particularly the New Testament, on the word world. God so loved the world, and yet in 1 John 2, 15, Christians are told, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vainglory of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Lord abideth forever. Again, notice how many times the reoccurring word world. How do you harmonize God so loved the world, and yet he tells us not to love the world? It is very apparent to Bible students that he loved the people of the world, and tells us not to love the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the vain glory. And thus, that's the harmony there. But in Mark 8, 36 and 37, our Lord said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We must understand that the mundane, secularized world is not the Christian's delight, but the people therein must be saved. So we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature in the world. Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, 18, and following. In uh, 2 Timothy 4, 10, a man who once was a fellow gospel preacher with Paul has this said of him, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. 1 John 5, 19 says, The whole world lieth in wickedness. And so we must make a distinction between the people of the world who have precious souls that need to be redeemed and the things of the world that cause us to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, 2 Timothy 3, verse 4. It is manifestly commanded of children of God to look beyond the things of the world, to the people of the world, and to the world beyond, heaven itself, and live in such a dedicated way that an abundant entrance shall be ministered unto us into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 1, 11, 
2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. Now we must confess that we're pilgrims and strangers in this life, just sojourners passing through in this world of sin and sorrow and degradation and shame, and that we abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. 1 Peter 2, 11, Hebrews 11, 10. It is incumbent upon us then to make a great distinction between the people of the world who have precious souls that need to be redeemed and the things of the world that we're to shun. Come out of her, O ye my people. We read in Revelation chapters 11 and 18. We're not to be enamored by and overwhelmed by worldly things. In fact, we're to put to death the immorality of the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and add to our lives and to our faith godliness, self-control, purity, integrity, that we might be an example of the believers. 1 Timothy 4, 12, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We must walk after spiritual things and not after carnal delights. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Romans 12, verse 2. There are some things that the world of our day desperately needs to know. In fact, I would say there are some things the world must know in view of eternity, in view of the judgment day. First of all, we should realize we owe it to the world as Christians to show them the joy, contentment, peace, and satisfaction that belongs to faithful children of God. Peace passing understanding, to quote Philippians 4, 7. A tranquil and peaceful life in the midst of chaos, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. When we live on a plane above carnality and worldly shame, we can be compelling to those about us and draw them out of the world into Christ. To the Corinthians who had had a horrible background in worldliness, but now we're converted to Christ, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 and says, You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Unless people can tell that we have been with Jesus, Acts 4.13, unless they can see Jesus in us, John 12.21, and until we magnify Christ in the way we live, Philippians 1.20, as we live for Christ, we are letting the Lord down and are a disservice to those in the world about us. When we show the joy unspeakable and full of glory that Christians possess, 1 Peter 1.7-8, the abundant life which Christ bequeaths unto his servants, John 10, 10, and that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17, will have a compelling influence on those who observe the vast distinction between the people of God and the followers of Satan. One reason we don't convert more people in this day and time is we're too much like the people of the world. In John 15, 19, our Lord said to his devotees, You are not of this world, because I've chosen you out of the world. My brethren, that's the way it ought to be. But much of the time, we wallow around in the quagmire of evil that the world has embraced, and then wonder why we can't pull people out of the world into the kingdom. The Greek word translated church is ekklesia, which means the called out, meaning in regard to Christianity, called out of a wicked world into the marvelous light of the Son of God's love, as we read in Colossians 1.13. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, notice the vivid contrast between Christians and the world in the ideal standard. You, writing to Christians, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a people after God's own possession, that you should show forth the praise of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims that you abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your life honest in the sight of the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they should behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Thus, the world must see in us. The world needs to know the joy of Christianity the inner satisfaction that comes from putting the kingdom of God absolutely first, Matthew 6, that you may be blameless and harmless, 
the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of truth. The beautiful, compelling command to Christians, Philippians 2, 15 and 16. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we show the contentment, Philippians 4, 11, and the urge to serve God that Philippians 4.13 commands, and tell the world our God will supply all our needs, Philippians 4.19, the world will rush to see what it is about Christianity that gives joy in believing. May God help us to realize the world about us needs to know the joy of Christianity. We've got too many people who claim to be Christians that are morose, down in the mouth, pessimistic, and who haven't said in a long time, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For if God be for us, who can be against us? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Powerful excerpts from Romans 8, the most brilliant chapter in the Bible on the joy of Christianity. The world needs to see in us the world needs to know the joy of Christianity, but the world desperately needs to know how to become a Christian. There are so many false doctrines roaming around out in the world, and those teachings which are so popular are never backed up by Scripture. And a lot of people believe they're Christians when they aren't. They're taught false theories on how to become a Christian. And instead of turning the book of Acts, the book that tells us how sinners became saints, how the worldlings became Christians, and following those examples of conversion, Many people are adverse to such study and are oblivious to the fact that the Bible tells precisely how to become a Christian. If there's anything that man out there in the world steeped in sin needs most desperately to know right now, it's how to become a Christian. You begin in Acts chapter 2, the day Christianity had its august beginning. Those who gladly received the word were baptized, and the Lord added them to his church. Verse 41 of Acts 2. That follows the command to sinners who requested salvation to repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, under his authority, Acts 4, 7, Colossians 3, 17. For the remission of sins. There's the way sins are removed, remitted, cleansed, forgiven. And in Acts 3, 19, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and he will send Christ unto you. In Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 10, 47 and 48, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Peter's words of inspiration, divinely authorized by heaven to Cornelius. Galatians 3, 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Romans 6, 1 to 5, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. We become in that process dead to sin, alive unto God, having obeyed from the heart that form of teaching delivered us. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and spirit to enter the kingdom. People who say, I'm in the kingdom, but I haven't been baptized yet. I'm saved, but I haven't been baptized. Run full circle to Acts 22, 16 and find their teaching is false. Saul of Tarsus was told, here's what you must do. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sometimes people say, baptism has nothing to do with washing away sin. That's not what the Bible says. In 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who has gone into heaven, angels and principalities and authorities being made subject unto him. You see, in that passage, baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Here's a good question. How can you have a good conscience toward God refusing to be baptized or thinking it's unessential and non-important? The world desperately needs to know the joy of Christianity and then exactly, minutely, correctly, biblically how to become a Christian so they can inherit those joys. And then the world needs to know how to live the Christian life once they're in the Lord. I'm afraid a lot of people have been converted to baptism instead of to Christ. They have been immersed in water and dry off by the tank and 
go back to the world. The world needs to know what the 21 New Testament epistles on Christian living have to say about life once we're in Christ. Let's take a few of those passages in these books, Romans through Jude, written to Christians on how to live for the Lord and let the world know what it means to live for Jesus. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. But you can't die in the Lord if you don't live in the Lord. And thus we must persevere. We must continue. We must be steadfast, Acts 2, 42. And not weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6, 9. The last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, a book on Christian living, tells saints of God in the first century, in the 20th century, and all other subsequent centuries, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Titus 2.12 sums up Christian living. We're to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. 2 Peter 3.18 commands in Christian living, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hebrews 3.13 and James 5 tells us that we're to exhort, admonish, rebuke one another every day, lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, and we must restore the erring brother and save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. That's James 5, 19 and 20. And so the world needs to know what is required of them once they're in the Lord. We're to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, Micah 6, 8. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. And the lifetime challenge of serving Jesus in Christianity is something the world needs to know. I'm not being facetious or unkind. A lot of my brethren need to know this too. We don't hear a lot of preaching on daily Christian living anymore. We wander around in the morass of ignorance and in the worldly state of our neighbors who don't even claim to be Christians. We need to know what the Bible says about living for Christ. But there's something else the world needs to know. And we, the people of God, need to portray and convey it unto them. And that's how to act in times of stress. How to depend upon God when things don't go so well. We've read of books and uh, films on why bad things happen to good people. But you can start with the book of Job. There's one of the best men who ever lived. And yet he was afflicted. He was isolated. His friends turned their back upon him. His wife said, curse God and die. A young self-appointed prophet came to agitate and aggravate also. But in Job 13, 15, that ancient sufferer said, In the depths of faith, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job finally learned, God bless the latter end of Job more than his beginning, Job 42, 12, to walk hand in hand with God through trials and tribulations, persecution and anguish. And with much tribulation we enter the kingdom, Acts 14, 22, People who say, I became a Christian and there's something wrong because I still have problems, misses the whole point. God didn't say Christians wouldn't have problems. He said, I'll provide you with a way to handle them, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Oh, I've had lots of problems since I obeyed the gospel of Christ and became a Christian. But thank God in his blessed word, I have an avenue of escape and I have some righteous teaching that warms my heart and thrills my soul and prepares me to live under the banner of persecution and tribulation. The Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, besought the Lord again and again and again to remove his thorn in the flesh, something that plagued him, and the Lord said, no, but you'll grow strong because of your trials, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Have you read Psalm 119, verse 67 and 71 lately? The psalmist cried, before I was afflicted, I went astray. It has been good for me to be afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. See, Christians are told, those who have obeyed the truth and are living the Christian life, cast all your care upon the Lord, he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. And that all things work together for good to those who love God. Not that everything would be defined as good by humanity, but it works together for good to those who love God. And thus the Bible is replete with passage after passage that tells the Christian, even in the midst of suffering, pray without ceasing, rejoice evermore, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. We're heirs of all spiritual blessings in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. And he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians 3, 20. In fact, the Lord said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again, Luke 6, 38. 
Listen to the psalmist as he discusses how to bear up in times of trials and stress. And the world needs to know this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I've been young and now I'm old, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. He delivered me because he delights in me. He is my shield, my buckler, my high tower. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. All of those in the book of Psalms tells us what the world needs to know. There's help out there when you meet up with manifold trials, James 1 verse 2. When you're persecuted for righteousness sake, Matthew 5, 10 to 12. The Lord is there and we can lean upon him. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says so. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. In a powerful, beautiful statement often overlooked and shunned, Psalm 91, 15 finds the Lord saying, I will be with you in trouble. I'll answer you. In Isaiah 38, 5, he said to Hezekiah, I've seen your tears. I've heard your prayers. And we have a source of blessing and help the world doesn't comprehend, isn't aware of. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given unto him, it should be recompensed to him again. For of him, by him, to him are all things. To whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. The last paragraph of the beautiful 11th chapter of the book of Romans in the heart of the New Testament. The psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. And in the cadence of the 124th Psalm, over and over he says, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. But Psalm 107, verse 21 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works, the children of men. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visit him. Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm 116, 12. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee. I love the Lord, for he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Psalm 130, verse 1. Psalm 116, verse 1. And so there's help out there for the person who trusts in God, who leans heavily upon the Lord. He has said, I will be with you all the way, even in the world, Matthew 28, 20. I'd hate to not have that promise in my life. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, something the world certainly needs to know and brethren need to be reminded of. The Lord said, let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. We ought to, in the language of the beautiful poem by Henry Van Dyke, in harmony and uh, synchronize with many Bible passages, have the ability to say and mean, not my will, but thine be done. With eager heart and will on fire, I sought to win my great desire. Peace shall be mine, I said, but life grew bitter and endless strife. My soul was weary, my pride wounded deep to heaven. I cried, God, give me peace or I must die. The dumb stars glittered no reply. Broken at last, I bowed my head, forgetting all myself, and said, Whatever comes, God's will be done. And in that moment, peace was won. And when we learn to say, God's will be done in my life, we've learned something the whole wide world needs to know, that the Lord will be our sustainer, and he will bless us mightily. And last of all, the world needs to know there's a judgment day coming. You can't live in a haphazard, indifferent uncaring lifestyle and be ready for the judgment day. Each one of us shall give account of himself to God, Romans 14, 12. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, Paul wrote in Romans 2, 16, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the deeds done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It is appointed a man once to die, after this come a judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. And the judge of all the earth will do what's right. Genesis 18, 25. And when we stand before his august, remarkable throne for judgment, we'll be judged by the words of Christ, John 12, 48, and would give a thousand worlds like this if we had just one moment to come back and do God's will and make amends to be ready for the judgment day. Jesus said in John 8, 21 to evil men, you shall die in your sins, and where I go you cannot come. 
Except we believe in the Lord, we'll die in our sins, John 8, 24. Except we repent, we'll perish, Luke 13, 3. And except a man be born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 7. And one day, in view of the august, awesome judgment of Almighty God, we will wish we had known how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, how to bear up under trials, how to show the joy of Christianity, to be ready for the judgment day. There's a great day coming, a bright day coming, and a sad day coming, the day of judgment. The world needs to know that. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. May God help us to give heed to these significant biblical matters, things that the world really needs to know. We would like to make available to you on our program today either a free audio cassette of Johnny's message, or Johnny has written a track that we believe goes well with the subject that he presented today. It's a track entitled, Peace Passing Understanding. We would be happy to send it to you if you'll write us this week, and we will send it to you free of charge. Write us at The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Let me read that to you one more time. You can write us at The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865. Hearst, Texas, 76053. Feel free to request either the tract written by Johnny entitled Peace, Passing, Understanding, or we have a free audio cassette tape of the sermon that Johnny presented. Either of these, yours for the asking, no cost, no obligation. We hope that this has been a blessing to your life, that you'll study the Word of God and know what He would have you to do. We love you. We appreciate you. We want nothing but the best for you in view of God's will and eternity. We hope to see you in our study again. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth.